Hello, everybody, and welcome to another interview with the artist. And today, we are sitting down with... I, I, I really couldn't be more excited about this. We're sitting down with Gareth Nicholas, former GW sculptor, multi, multi, multi-time Golden Demon winner, all-around amazing artist, and somebody that I am very lucky and proud to call my friend and just an all-around great human being. Gareth, how are you doing today, buddy? Hey, I'm great. Thanks very much, Vince. And uh, thanks for the invite to be on your show. It's a real honor. Uh, um, you know, I've been a long time admirer of the work that you're doing. So, uh, yeah, it's great. Well, thank you, sir, very much. Just as a, as a, I'll share a quick personal story before, uh, before we get into the interview that I think really displays Gareth's character and why he's such an awesome guy. Two years plus ago or something, I went over to my first event at Warhammer World for my first Golden Demon. And, you know, I had certainly done plenty of competing in painting before then, but to say I was nervous is an understatement. And uh, Gareth couldn't have been nicer. He came up to me, he introduced himself. He was like a friend in the storm of anybody who's been to Warhammer Fest knows it's absolutely crazy because there's just so many people and so many entries and it was like completely overwhelming and he was like the nicest guy and you just like i cannot explain how nice it was to have a friend there and you made the whole experience so much better my wife is like he was the nicest guy and just says that to this day and remembers you so i just want to say thank you from a personal level man it meant so much oh that's cool man i, I wasn't quite sure it was you because you looked so much taller than i was expecting <laughs> I see you all walk in the world, and kind of, I think because the camera's above you looking down, and I kind right. of had it in my head, you were quite short. And then I saw this guy wandering around, and I was like, I think that's Vince. So I had to go and introduce myself. But yeah, yeah, it was cool. Well, I also wasn't wearing an apron at Warhammer World. so That's that true. Yeah, 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 you made a mistake there. Absolutely. That's usually how people can know for sure. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, we want to get into your journey as an artist today. We're going to go through all that. We're going to, of course, look at some of uh, Gareth's pieces. Up right now, you can see the gorgeous Eisenhorn that he painted. This was obviously one of the special edition sort of releases from a little while back. And it is absolutely amazing the job he did with it. One of my, one of my favorite pieces amongst a host of incredible pieces that Gareth's done. Uh, so let's get into it, man. So we start with the same place we start with everybody, which is the beginning, right? So how did you get into miniature painting? Like, what was your journey to decide you wanted to get into this weird hobby to collect <laughs> little plastic people and start putting paint on them? Ah, uh, yes, the origin story. Yes. Um, yeah, so I knew you were going to ask me about this. It was quite fun, actually, just thinking back and trying to remember, you know, the sequence of, of events. But um, the first thing that, that got me into it was... Um, Back in, oh, it would have been, I would have been about nine or ten, so we're talking late 80s or about 1990, on a family holiday in uh, southwest UK. Um, so, of course, it was chucking it down the rain. And me and my younger brother must have been being even more of a pain than normal um, because my mum sort of vanished at one point. And next thing I know, she's come back with Hero Quest. And that was it, you know, we spent must have been the whole of that day and pretty much the rest of the holiday as much as we could get away with just playing hero quest um and i was hooked immediately you know i've never seen anything like that and, and it was you know the miniatures and that i mean that was that was what grabbed me straight away see just, uh, i knew we were simpatico that you were <laughs> brothers from another mother because uh that is exactly the same way that I got into like the whole world of fantasy. It was Hero Quest, right? Like, I mean, I, I I'm with you. I played that until we wore out the pieces, right? Like it was it was just it was revel it was a revel revelatory experience. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Continue. I'm sorry. No, no, that's cool, man. Um so I I mean I never I don't think it ever occurred to me at the time to paint to try and paint the pieces in there. But I remember looking at on the side of the box, they had like all the miniatures painted, you know, they had pictures of all the characters and I thought they looked amazing. Um, but then it was like uh, probably a year or so later, a friend of mine at school suddenly shows up with this space marine um, and he, he painted it. I mean, it must've been awful, but it looked like the coolest thing to me. <laughs> and I was like, what, what's that, you know? And so right. all of a sudden I'm, I'm, into, I'm into all this, uh, all this 40K stuff. And, um, 
we lived in a fairly small town at the time and this was you know gw wasn't didn't have as many stores as it has now and right. so we had to to get hold of this stuff we had to go like it was about 25 miles or something to the next town so whenever my mum would wanted to go on like one of her shopping trips to this town you know we we try and tag along and then so and then we try and get her to take us to this model shop um so it wasn't a proper games workshop but it had um you know airfix and right. modern trains and then they had a few of these of these miniatures um and i can remember the first time going there and just not having a clue what i was buying and coming back with like i think some bretonian archers and um some adeptus arbites and <laughs> like I think my brother had some Skaven or something like that. Um, and of course, we knew we needed to paint them. So we got some paints as well and a paintbrush. But because our budget was, you know, I don't know, a few, a few quid, we had about three or four paints probably. Sure. I don't know, maybe five paints. And so we get home and I start, I start going to paint this archer and I immediately realise I haven't got any kind of flesh tone to paint this thing. <laughs> And one of these paints was, um, I think it was called Elf Grey. Obviously, it's from one of the older, older Citadel Rangers. Yep. And um, in my like ten-year-old head, it was like, oh well, you know, he's not an elf, but it's close enough. So I'll just paint his face with this Elf Grey. It'll be fine. <laughs> so, so my first, my first painting miniature was like this Bretonian bowman with Elf Grey paint straight from the pot, you know, sure. slapped onto his face, and then just whatever colours we happened to pick up all over him. Uh, so it must have looked horrendous. And then we played some games with them. You know, we didn't have any idea about the rules. There was we didn't have any kind of box game or anything like that. So we right. just made up our made up our own game, me and my brother, you know. I don't even know if we rolled dice. But it was awesome, you know. And uh, that was my first sort of proper experience of painting. Um That's awesome. That's great. It's funny too because I think about looking back on those miniatures. I, I and like it's funny too because we're we're about the same age, uh, and yeah. <clears throat> uh, so my experience in hitting these things is about the same time as you. And I think back on those first miniatures, and there's this. It's hard for me to remember how bad they looked because at the time I was so overjoyed that they were even painted. Right. Yeah. Like in my head, I look back and I'm like, Oh, those miniatures were cool. Right. And then, but I know if I saw it today and I do still have a few of those earlier things I painted. Like I remember I bought the empire war wagon. Right. right. Yeah. And it famously on the box, if you remember, it was a true, true nineties era color scheme, right? Black wood, uh, and then alternating red and yellow shingle oh, yeah. patterns. And it was, you know, in like on the color wheel, primary red, primary yellow, right? Uh, alternating. And so I was like, okay, well, this is easy to paint. All I need to do is get red and yellow. And I just, you know, primed it black. And I was like, oh, well, the black's done. And then I just started painting the red and the yellow just straight over the black. One coat, call it a day. We're good to go. Just yeah. slop it yeah. on thick. And and I still have that thing, and now I look at it and I'm like, oh god. <laughs> yeah, I kind of wish some of that stuff still is still was still around, but you know, it's been lost for for many many years. I've got no idea where any of that stuff is. It's probably been thrown away. So, yeah. So you you're we you start out there. You're you're painting the stuff. You're collecting these these things. You you came in through the GW route. I talk often about how there's like. There's sort of the four routes in, and and GW is obviously one of the main ones. You discover Space Marines, you discover Fantasy, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, exactly. And, then, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. Oh, right, I was going to say because yeah, because then of course when I went to secondary school um, and got a new group of friends, you know, that was when I discovered 40k properly because they they launched the second edition. Gotcha. Um, and that was like, oh wow, we we all got into that, um, and so we were just playing. You know, that was it then. Blood Angels was my thing. They were on the box, you know, for second edition. And, um, and that's when I properly started collecting, you know, an army. Um, and playing yeah, because board. that was the edition with the, like, captain with the big fist up in the air, right? Yeah. The Blood Angels captain yeah. with Bolter in the fist, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, because you had a pl load of plastic space marines and plastic orcs in there, and you had the cardboard cutouts as well for, like, the orc dreadnought. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, we, we'd play games, and um, those games against my school friends were just savage, you know. It was 
because we didn't have any conception of trying to make the game fun. You know, it was all right. trying to win. And second edition, if you were really trying to win, there was, you know, you could make it a really unpleasant experience. You'd, <laughs> you'd load up your army with as many like heavy weapons as you could get. You'd have these insane characters, you know, it'd always be like a chief librarian with Terminator armor and a displacer field. and. You know, and then it would be, we never had enough terrain, so we'd spend ages lining all our miniatures up, you know, getting the board set up. You'd roll up, someone would get turn one, and then it would be like, if you if you still had half your army when it was your turn, it was you were doing well, you know? <laughs> right, right, as did the obliteration rains from the yeah. sky from these weapons, yeah. Yeah, it was crazy. Um, so, yeah, it was good times, and then, you know, it was a bit more relaxed with my brother because, you know, I was going to school a fair distance away from where we lived, so... Me and my brother kind of got into all of the other games because that was like the first golden era of GW. You know, they were bringing out like Man of War and yep. um, Epic and Blood Bowl and all these other games. And so my brother and I would play those um, and had some really good fun with him. But yeah, everyone at school was like 40k, you know, so uh, loads of competitive 40k for a few years there. Gotcha. So you're very into the 40k side. You do it, yeah. and, and like all the, I remember that era of specialist games. You're right. Like it was just what we would think of now as specialist games, right? Yeah. And uh, it was amazing. There was just like some new, it, 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 it's it's better now. Like we get, because they, they're, they feel more integrated in the product and have good support. But like at that time, it blew me away, you know, because I, for me, the big one, I, I was more on the fantasy side. And I had my 40K army, you know, like third edition 40K was the one that really brought me in. I got I, I got tricked into playing 40k. Like I was a big fantasy person. I was like, I'll never play 40k. And then they came out with. Uh, do you remember Schaefer's Last Chancers? Did that, when was that? Was that like late nineties? Late nineties. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. See, I'd already I'd already dropped out of the hobby by then because I by about ninety six. Okay. They let, they let girls into our school. Ah. Then, so then, like everyone. And it wasn't just me. Everyone was like, "Oh, we're not playing. We're not playing that anymore." You know, we're too cool for that. <laughs> Which was ridiculous because me and my friends were like these straight A students that play Warhammer, and like looking back on it, we were never going to get a girlfriend. You know, <laughs> what what were we thinking? So we gave up on it completely. So I was out of the hobby for about oh, twenty years or something. Ninety six till no, it's less than that. Yeah, 96 to about 2006. I okay. Think, so probably. you spent that. You had your away decade. Yeah, yeah. So anything that came out in that period, I've got no knowledge of. You know, I came back and it was like Necrons. What are these? You know, Tau. Right, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, they, I got tricked into it because they came out with Schaefer's Last Chances, which the whole idea was it was about, it was 12 guys and they were all special and they were all characters and you could play them like an army against thousand point forces, right? And so my friend was like, oh, this is all you'll need to buy ever. And you can play 40K with us. And, and you know, this is what we'll do. And I was like, okay, sure, I'll give that a shot. So I went out and bought it. And then three months later, I had a full Imperial Guard army. Like, what the, what happened here? <laughs> so I certainly understand the opening turn salvo because I was into the tanks. And so it would just be like, I would set up as just a row of tanks and this the scantest minimum amount of infantry dudes with flashlights standing in front of them. And, you know, when it was my turn, it was just time to start bombing the other side. Yeah. Uh, and the rules, because, like, the rules were a little bit ambiguous, I seem to remember, for right. second edition. And uh, the rules lawyering that would go on, you know, it was like, it doesn't matter that it doesn't make sense. If you can interpret something to your advantage, then then that's what you were going to do. So, yeah, those, those games were just crazy. Yep. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm just answering a comment real quick here. Uh, the uh, sorry for the typing noise. There we go. All right. So uh, so you spent you 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 as well did your your time in the wilderness. Everybody <laughs> I've talked to more or less has. We all have that time, right? That time in the wilderness where we go away from the hobby. It's often girl related. Uh, so I, I get it. No, it's very normal. We all were like, oh no, we're going to be cool. And then we come to a point later on exactly, you know, where you're like, oh, never mind. That doesn't actually matter at all. I'm going to go back to doing what I have fun with. So 2006 comes around. What, what brings you back in? Well, yeah, I mean, 2006, because what had happened was I'd, I'd taken a job in Belgium. And so I had a year in Belgium on this contract and 
at the weekends i did not have a massive amount to do because i didn't really know very many people outside of work so i was just bored basically so i was wandering around the town i was staying in one day and i just came across this model shop and they had i think it was like wood elves had just come out or something so they had loads of wood elves in the window and i was thinking oh yeah i could just i could just buy some miniatures and paint them you know that'd be something to do so i went in i bought i think it was um high elf spearman um unit um because i always liked elves sure um but they weren't the best models either those ones because they had i think they were already quite old by then so they had quite big and not not very elven. Was that really. like the monopose um, kit? No, no, because I think that was the one in the. I remember there being a monopose kit in the um, fourth edition, right? Fantasy Battle Bot. Because yep. we had that, and I, I had the elves out of that, so I was kind of I had a bit of nostalgia for them. Now this was like a proper. I mean, you could pose them a bit. I think they had separate torsos from their legs, but. It, you know how it was with fantasy battle you couldn't really do a lot of posing sure it was like you you had this anyway, um, yeah you could kind of yeah, um, arms, yeah. You, know, like, you know just they're supposed to be uniforms so. yep so you pick up these elves you're 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 out there for work you're like oh yeah great okay i'll get me some elf spearmen yeah so yeah, how does that them. cascade because that there there's your first <laughs> hit you're back in right it's keep trying yeah. to get out but they pull me back in well, that's the thing so and at that time, I still, I mean, I don't have any of these miniatures, but I'm pretty sure I still didn't really have a very good concept of what made a good paint job. I think I was still, I hadn't really grasped that you should thin your paints. I think I was still pretty much just painting straight out of the pot. And I was probably doing like a, a line, just a one line highlight on these things and, and maybe shading just straight into a recess with some thick paint. But I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like, producing anything of a particularly amazing quality. Um, yeah, I came back from, from Belgium, having just messed around really painting a few bits and pieces. And then that, that kind of carried on for a few years. So I think an, an edition of 40K came out maybe 2007, it might've been fifth edition or something. And I, I started painting some Blood Angels again. And the whole time I was just thinking, oh, I'm gonna paint these miniatures and then I'm gonna play a game with them at some point. Right. Um, and so I was kind of building up these small forces and it never really happened because, you know, people have moved on. None, none of my friends were anywhere near me from, from school. Um, my brother was miles away. Um, so although I was still painting this stuff, it didn't really have a purpose. And then it must have been around 2010. Um, cool Mini or Not was kind of at its height, I think. And um, I'd seen... I always remember it was the like the Sanguinor that, that Darren Latham had painted because yep. at the time he was he was in heavy metal. I think he was lead heavy metal painter at the time. And him and Joe T were like just really pushing the level of painting, you know, because the stuff that comes out of heavy metal is always amazing. But I feel like when those two were there, they were kind of pushing each other. And then all of a sudden they were coming out with this non-metallic metal stuff. And I remember, and of course, the Sanguinor, it was Blood Angel. So I was immediately going to love that anyway. And I was right. just, I looked at this thing and I was like, that is amazing. You know, why, why don't my paint jobs look anything like that? And, and so then, like I say, like, call me or not was a thing and you could go on forums. So I went on there and there was like tutorials on there. Um, and I joined another, another forum that was kind of focused around UK painters. Um, and there was people on there that had won Golden Demons and you could post pictures of your work and start getting feedback. So I, f I fairly quickly worked out what I needed to do, you know, where I was going wrong. Right. Like in your paints, it was like a revelation, you know, because I'd heard that before. And I think what must have happened was I'd tried it. I'd so I'd got some paint, I'd added some water to it. And I'd missed out the critical step, which is to then wipe the excess off your brush. Ah, uh, the wicker. Yeah, on the miniature, and it just gone, <laughs> gone everywhere. And I'm like, well, this is this doesn't work, you know. This is nonsense. I'll just go back to doing what I what I always do. I'm just gonna, you know, paint paint from the pot because I can control the paint then. You know, I know where it's gonna go. But once I'd sort of worked that out, things things move quite quickly, I think. Uh, and just having that resource, because you know, when I was, you know, you look back in the '90s, and 
I didn't have it. I mean, the internet didn't even really exist, you know, and I certainly didn't have access to it or any way of learning how to paint. There was no one to, to explain. Oh, no. I mean, the best tutorial we got was like a white dwarf where famously the three steps were <laughs> paint, shade, complete. Like yeah. complete was a step. That's not a step. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were awesome, those things. I do remember those because we had we had quite a few white dwarfs knocking about and they, they were not very helpful for, no. for teaching you how to paint. My stuff was always neat. And like amongst my friends, I was... I was always the one that had more painted models. Most people didn't care, you know, that it would be a sea of gray and metal, you know. And I, I always, the, the look of it was always really important to me, but I wasn't producing good quality stuff. And it, it took until like 2010 to realize what I was doing wrong. Gotcha. Um, so it's a, it was a long period of, <laughs> of not producing very good stuff. <laughs> Well, it doesn't surprise me that you like one of the things that defines your work is is the cleanliness of paint. Like you have you're such a precise painter. And so it doesn't surprise me that you had kind of that already uh, in your in your quiver as you were going forward. I would imagine that would serve you well. So, yeah, yeah you're like you've, you've always come across to me as somebody who really has uh like your your brush control is always very fine. Everything on your miniatures looks extremely intentionally placed and well placed. Yeah, it's funny. I think there's something in my brain that's like not wired up correctly or something because I can remember even as like a really young kid, you know, you'd be given like a drawing assignment in school or something. And my my stuff would always be like intricately detailed and really neat, you know, but uh, whereas other people would be a little bit more expressive, you know, and I think that's always been with me. And that's always the way I paint miniatures is, is always like that. You know, I'd say I'm technically very proficient, but I always think I'm not really an artist. I'm not very creative. You know, it's 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 more of a, yeah, just a, a technique, really. A hundred percent. My God, do I feel what you're saying there? Like <laughs> I the, the the I've never felt like an artist ever right because it, i feel like i i always feel like a technician or a craftsman often yeah. when i'm doing this more than an artist it just in my own personal experience and that's it's something that challenges and and of course that's crazy i mean the stuff you make is is gorgeous and you make artistic choices all the time and you're like we're gonna look at some of your work and i mean there's no universe where I would look at what you're doing and not say that's art done by an artist. Like that would be madness. Uh, so, but, but I get, but nonetheless, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So, okay. So you're, you're, you're improving. It's 20, you know, it's 2010, that period after. And I agree. Like there was this sort of thing that happened on the internet in the 2010s, right? where all of a sudden knowledge just started getting shared. Yeah. You know, I look back on especially the early 2000s and there was a lot of people really pushing it and doing some incredible stuff with miniature painting like that brought us out of the dark ages of the 90s and and bright single colors and stuff. But those techniques you had to like know those people. Basically, there wasn't really yeah. a lot of knowledge sharing going on, right? Yeah, you had to kind of be in the club. And then all of a sudden something flipped, like partially maybe YouTube forums like you were talking about. There's just a lot of stuff that all happened in the 2010s where everybody started sharing knowledge. And suddenly we live in a world where we can learn from other people. And everybody was like keen to start talking about it and forming a community, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of those forums back then were, were super great. You know, I mean, some of the people I'm really I'm still really grateful to, to the people that bothered to kind of tell me what I was doing wrong and, you know give me a few pointers because it, it really helped. And, you know, I, I made some, I think in quite a short period, it was about a year, I made such a big jump from just producing absolute rubbish to stuff that was half decent, you know, and it was all down to just people giving me some good feedback. Well, I talk about that all the time, that one of the most important things you can do in your painting is is get feedback, right? Like get yeah. feedback from people who, who know, who are experienced, who can actually share knowledge with you. Like direct feedback on your work will generally improve your, your output. Like it'll help you take your next step on your hobby journey faster than just about anything, right? Yeah. Um, you can, you know, you can watch all the tutorials in the world, but if you then don't go and check your work, 
you're never going to actually know how you're doing, right? It's like you can you can read, but when you take the test, it's got to get graded. Otherwise, you don't know how well you actually retained everything, right? So, yeah, that's right. So when did you make the leap then? So your 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 painting's improving. We're up to half decent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm never going to say any of my stuff's better than half decent. So that's as good as it gets. <laughs> very, very British of you. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so you're, you're up there. When did you say, okay, you know what? I think I want to go compete. Like, where did that it, jump happen? Because that's always an interesting leap for people. It is, isn't it? And I can't, I can't really remember what my thought process was because I think what, what probably happened was I was sharing stuff on the internet and I was thinking, yeah, I think, you know, my stuff's decent. You know, it's, it's comparable to what other people are, are putting out. And I kind of thought... I need to see some other miniatures like in in the flesh you know it's right. it's all very well sharing these photos but i mean i'm sure you know it's quite easy to make things not look with miniatures you can kind of make things look better than they are or you can certainly make them look a lot worse than they are if the photo is not lit well or something like that i know a lot more about that latter than the former i've never unlocked <laughs> the mystery of good photos but yes I, I understand that that is something some people are capable of out there yeah. yeah i mean i've never been i've never been able to use photoshop but um i know i know that that is a that is an avenue that's available to you if you, if you really care about these things so yeah i was curious really and so i um i I went to my local GW, um, so that was Oxford, as I was working in Oxford at the time. So I went to, they they were just running regular painting competitions, I think like every month or something, they'd have okay. a painting competition. Um, and so, I mean, I wasn't a regular there by any means, but I, I just decided to, to go along and I took, uh, I think it was Lella Thesprax, the Dark Eldar lady yeah, yeah. that I painted. And um, yeah, I just thought it would be interesting just to see, you know, what other people are doing. And um, yeah, that that was like the standard there was not super high, so that wasn't a, a particularly great learning experience. You know, it was I, I took I took along this miniature, and you know, it was quite a lot. <laughs> even even wanting to be modest, it was quite a lot better than anything else that was there. <laughs> so sure. so I thought, okay, well, I'll try something else, and then um, you know, uh, I was always aware of Golden Demon. I mean, obviously back in even back in the 90s, Golden Demon was a thing. There was no oh, yeah. no hope I was going to get to it, but I knew it was it existed. Um, and so I thought, oh, okay, maybe I'll try that. You know, I'll I'll go along to um, to Golden Demon and just see see what what the standards like there. You know, see how my stuff compares to it. Sure. Um, so that was 2011. The um, the first Golden Demon I went to um, that was at Birmingham NEC. That was still Games Days back then, rather than Warhammer Fest. But it was kind of the, the the last few games days, right? Um, so it was kind of it wasn't as big as it had been previously. Um, but I still remember being amazed when I got there. You know, I walked in for the first time, and they've got these massive banners hanging from the ceiling with Golden Demon on them, and there's all these huge glass cabinets, and they had like big TV screens showing the best entries that people have handed in. You know, this was before the results had come out, so it wasn't stuff that was going to win necessarily. It was just cool stuff that had caught the photographer's eye, you know. They need to bring back the TV screen thing. Yeah, that, that sounds really, awesome. That was really cool. I don't know, maybe they can't do that at the Rico Arena or something, but oh, the, yeah. the NEC was like, it's huge. I mean, it was, it was bigger than the Rico. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that was awesome. So it was like, wow, you know, this is the big time. <laughs> um, so I put, I, I'd taken three miniatures along. I just, I always stick to single miniature. It's what I like painting. Um, so, so the... I, the undisputed hardest category at yeah. Golden Demon. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, it's why I enjoy painting. I wasn't just gonna. I wasn't gonna. I was aware that you might have a better chance if you painted a squad or something like that. But I wasn't going in expecting to win. I was just like, I want to see what level I'm at. You know, right? Just I want to know. Maybe I'll get a finalist pin. That'd be fantastic. Yep. So I took along a 40k, uh, a fantasy entry, and a Lord of the Rings entry. So I covered the three single miniature categories. And as the day went on, you know, I was like, well, I'm sure you can relate. I was like, I was, I basically ignored the whole of the rest of games day, didn't bother going looking at any of the stuff, you know, the studio, yep. what they were showing. I was like, I don't care. You know, I just spent the whole day looking in the cabinets or trying to, you, you know, you've got to fight your way in. And, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Packs and all, <laughs> uh, and then and then when the when the judges were 
have the miniatures on the table. I'm like, you know, looking to see if maybe they're looking at my miniature. Yeah, and I just yep. have a whole day doing that. Um, for for but, people who've never had this experience, when you say I can relate, <laughs> my God, can I relate? Like, yes, yes, it is because it. For, for people who've never been to like Wormer Fest or one of these big things, I really would recommend you go. It's a singularly awesome experience. And just the level of what you experience there is so amazing. It's just like if you enjoy miniature painting and looking at incredibly painted miniatures, I mean, it's it's such a it's mind blowing. Like it's hard for me to even put into words because I spend most of the day looking in the case just going oh my God, that one's amazing. That one's amazing. That looks gorgeous. What is that? That is beautiful. And and then, yeah, when they're judging, they sit in like the middle generally. And so you're just like staring through the glass, like trying to get a peek of like what they're looking at. Oh, is it, oh what's, what's it? You know, and it, if you are on the table, you don't want to yeah. like, <laughs> so, because like if, they, if you do get pulled to the table, you're like, oh, okay, they're looking at my piece, you know? And then there's the worst thing where they'll pick it up and they'll look at it and then they'll just set it to the side. Yeah, and it goes over the side, and it's like, oh I, no, it's the set it to the side move. Oh no. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. No, that's exactly the experience, and I think it gets better. You know, I've, I've been to quite a few of these now, and I'm not as bothered anymore. Right. I, I remember that first one. It was it was nerve wracking. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was I was ecstatic because I, I found out fairly fairly quickly all three pieces had got finalist pins. So I was I was absolutely delighted with that. Um, and then of course I'm look, I'm watching as they're judging, and and they, I think they, they went through in order, and it's like you know 40k they do all 40k categories first probably, and then it was like fantasy, and and both. So my 40k one as, exactly as you described very quickly. It was on the finalist table, and then it was on the side. And yeah. It was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then fantasy comes along, and I think pretty much the same thing happened. And you know, no surprise. Uh, and then Lord of the Rings comes along, and and miniatures are getting put on the side, and and mine's still there, and they're still looking at it. And and in the end, I, I wasn't quite sure what they decided, and they and I saw Alan Merritt, who was the chief judge at the time, just go. So one, two, three, like that, over three of the miniatures, and I couldn't see which ones he'd done. Oh, no. And I was like, oh, okay, mine was still in that group, right? They whittled it down, but there were still a few miniatures in there. Um, and then they put the miniatures back in the cabinets, and then there was three of them on their own shelf. They still do this now. And mine was one of those. And I'm like, wait, wait does that mean I'm, what, I'm one of the three? You know, right. and no one explains to you. I had no idea. Um, so I was just going around wondering. Uh, for like an hour or so. This feels like, very uh, familiar. <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. And then, and then I finally realized when for sure, because they read out the names to go to the stage right. to collect the awards. So I, I managed to get the bronze uh, for Lord of the Rings single miniature, which, you know, that was just amazing. I was, I was thrilled. And just to go up on stage and, you know, it was a big crowd in those days because you had, I think you had, because there was more gaming going on, there was a lot more people there probably. Right. I mean, it's not a bad crowd at Warhammer Fest, don't get me wrong, but I think it, it felt bigger. Um, yeah, it was crazy. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so I'll come home with my statue and I'm like, yes, you know, I've done it. I've got, I've got a golden beam and I can, I can rest easy now. That's sure. it. I'm done. <laughs> and honestly, I thought I'd never go back. I thought that was it, you know. Oh, if we could only talk to 2011 Garrett now. <laughs> Mission accomplished. I'd sort of validated myself, and I thought, well, that's it now. You know, I know I'm. I know that I'm not like I'm not top level. I'm not winning the Slayer Sword. I'm not getting golds for my, you know, my forty k miniatures. But I'm not far off. You know, so I was I was happy. I was happy with that. Nice, nice. So obviously you did go back. Okay. Yeah. So did you keep competing fairly regularly over the years, or? Yeah. I think I've went, I think I must have been to Golden Demon. Like, I don't think I've missed a year since 2011. Right. So, yeah, because I think, and I think every year I've probably been through the same thing where I just go, oh, I, I probably won't bother going back next year. And then by the time, by the time six months has gone past, you know, I still love painting. So I've still been painting things. Right. And before you know it, you've got things that you could enter into Golden Demon and you just think, well, you know, I've got this, I, could, I'm, I might as well go and enter it, you know. Right. <laughs> and uh, and of course, as the years have gone by, I've met more and more people, and that's 
going to Golden Demon is pretty much the only time of the year I'm going to see them. Right. So they're really great guys, you know, Richard Gray, Andy Wardle, people like that. I shouldn't start listing names because I then I'll forget people. And you know, that's, I don't want to, I don't want to upset anyone. But there's there's a load of great painters, yep. and that's the only time that I'll see them. So these days, you know, if I go to Golden Demon, it's mainly just to see to see people and say hello and catch up with them. And and the painting side of it is just a bonus, really. It's absolutely true. The community that's there is so amazing, and it is a great chance because it's the same. It's the same for me, obviously, especially because I don't live in the same country as many of these people, right? So, it's a, when I when I come over there for for fest, it's such a great chance to just actually see people and catch up and talk and hang out and just discuss the hobby and you know what people are working on and stuff like that. And it's. Mm-hmm. It really is a wonderful, unique community that's just awesome to be a part of. Like, I, I couldn't – there's so many reasons to go, and that's just another one in a long list, right? Yeah. Um, awesome. So then, obviously, at some point, you uh, you started working uh, for GW, so you couldn't compete in the, in the main categories <laughs> anymore because you went into the, you went into the uh, sculpting studio, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um... – so that all started um, about 2015. So um, I know we're going to talk about my, my Blood Angels diorama, but that was yes. like a huge piece that I did in 2015. Um, and once I completed that, um, I kind of, I didn't know where to go with my painting at that point because I'd kind of, I'd reached this level where I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do this better than that. Because um, up until that point, there'd always been like something something more that I could try, you know, some new technique or, um, you know, I could make this better. I could do some freehand. There was always something. And I, I kind of, that was like the culmination of everything. And I put so much effort into it. I was kind of looking for a new challenge. And I just thought, well, I'll, I'll try sculpting. You know, I've never done that. That really looks like that could be fun, you know, and that's a whole new area for me to, to start trying to learn. Right. Because I, I, I think I must have tried physical sculpting at some point and got nowhere with it because I had some green stuff and it was the same problem I had with painting you know there was no one to tell you what to do and I can remember this intensely frustrating experience of just you know mixing up this green stuff and then not not waiting for it to cure or anything just trying to sculpt something with it and it would just stick to the tools and it would it would it wouldn't stick to where I wanted it and I couldn't get anything close to a miniature out right of it. right it this really frustrating experience so I probably tried it once or twice and just thought, nah, this isn't for me. I don't know what I'm doing and I don't know how to find out how to get how to get better. Um, but, um, uh, you know, by the, by the time we get to 2015, obviously computers have moved on <laughs> quite a long way. Um, so I started just sculpting um, digitally with free software that you can still download. I, I use Blender, which is this is amazingly capable free software. Um, and I just started playing around with that and sculpting. Um, uh, of course, if you work digitally, the problem you've got is getting stuff actually made physically. Right. Um, so I was sending my designs to this company, Shapeways. Um, oh, yeah, sure. And you, you just submit your STL to them, and then you pay your money. And then a week or two later, uh, a package shows up at your door, and they've printed your design. Um, so to keep the, the costs down, I was kind of... Um, I was sculpting really small things like uh, 15 mil miniatures and gotcha. uh, ships, you know, out of nostalgia for Man of War, I was doing these little ships. So I didn't want to commit my my finances to sculpting full-size Warhammer miniatures or anything sure. like that. You, um, were, you weren't it, making like three-ups or something and then having them send you <laughs> no, a giant box no. in the mail? Because this is the thing with, with Shapeways, it was like, you know, you're paying for the volume of, of material that we, you were using. So right. if you make it really small, then it was only going to cost you a few pounds, you know. Um, but if, if you started making decent sized miniatures, they were it was like, you know, oh, I don't know, 30, 40 quid or something, which is not the end of the world. But what I, what I usually found was what I, what I thought looked on, good on the screen when I got the physical copy of it, it looked rubbish. You know, it was nothing, <laughs> nothing like what I thought, because there's... When you sculpt digitally, there's this learning process you have to go through where you have to make it so much more graphic on the screen than you think you do. Because when you, you know, everything on the screen is huge. Right. And so you think you've put this crease into some cloth or something, and it's, you know, it's maybe 
0.1 mil thick or something in reality. And so you get it back and you cannot see it. And so you have to go through this process. And when you're sending stuff off to shape bodies and waiting a few weeks, you know, it's kind of a slow learning process where right. you, you try something, it comes back, it looks rubbish. You go, hmm, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll adjust it. And then you get something else back. And gradually I got a little bit better. And then uh, at the time I was, I was working um, in back office in a retail bank. And, you know, the work was, was okay. It was fine, but it was never what I I was passionate about. I right. kind of taken that job because I had a science and engineering background. I was good with numbers. The pay was reasonable. Um, so I just ended up working there. Um, but I realized, you know, maybe, maybe if I keep getting better at sculpting, maybe I can go and, you know, I can make a living out of that instead. And I wasn't necessarily thinking I'll work at GW. I was thinking, well, you know, maybe I'll be a freelance sculptor or, right. or anything like that. So I just I just started working on that, you know, and um, and as I say, it was a whole new challenge for me after the the epic painting uh, effort. Um, so it was just a whole new load of stuff to learn, which is cool, you know, a whole new challenge. Um, and somewhere along the line, I just I must have uh, probably at a golden demon or something. I probably ran across um, Matt Toon, who's the um, the guy who runs the recruitment effort for the studio. Uh, and got and got talking to him about, you know, um, what it would take to sculpt Citadel miniatures. Right. Um, and obviously the first thing was, well, have you sculpted anything, uh, you know, like a Warhammer miniature? And I'm like, no, no not really. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I went away and sculpted a few figures that were actually Warhammer scale. <laughs> um, and I went back to him. And, you know, it's kind of long. It's kind of a long process. It, 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 it probably... It probably went for two or three years. Just um, I'd sculpt something, I'd, I'd send send pictures of it to him, um, and and we'd have a discussion, and I'd just carry on. And then eventually, I applied for the. Um, they had a trainee program. Well, I think I think the process is still the same now, although I haven't looked at it. You can apply to be a trainee Citadel miniature designer. Okay. But they don't necessarily have an opening in the studio. So you go, you submit your letter, you go through an interview process, and then if you're successful, you go on to this, um, so they call it a selection program. So you're given assignments and you complete the assignment, you send them the file, and then they print it out and you get feedback from people in the studio on what you've done. Oh, okay, that's cool. So I was thinking, okay, well, maybe I'm not gonna be able to work for GW, but I still wanna be on that program because that, feedback is like gold dust you know coming oh, yeah. from in the studio i want to be on that program so so yeah i signed up for that and um yeah i was successful obviously at the at the interview and got into this got into this selection program and then yeah i, I mean i can't remember exactly when that was it must have been like 2017 i think um so i did a few i did a couple of assignments um, and it starts off quite simple, like your first one is to copy an existing Citadel miniature. Sure, so they sent sure. you free miniatures, which was awesome. I got this package with free miniatures in it, and you had to choose a miniature to copy. Um, and so I did that, and, and then it moves on a bit, and they ask you to do some design work. And you know, um, before I knew it, they asked me to do another interview, um, and I went on to it thinking it was just going to be like feedback for a you know, one of these assignments. And the next thing I know, um, Matt Toon is saying, oh, well, you'll be pleased to know we're, we're going to offer you a job as a trainee Citadel miniature designer. That's awesome. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I was not expecting that. Um, so I didn't have to think too hard um, <laughs> about saying yes to that opportunity. Sure. Um, yeah, I moved to Nottingham, started that job in July, uh, 2018. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, and I've spent I spent about a year and a half there working in the studio, um, battling um, a very severe case of imposter syndrome the whole sure. time I was there. It's like, what the hell am I doing here? You know, it's, right. you're surrounded by such talented people, and and some of them have been doing it for 20, 30 years, and it's just amazing. It's the most amazing place, and they're all such uh, helpful people. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. 
Um, so yeah, as I say, I was there for about a year and a half, and um, in the end, I had to leave. It's purely for personal reasons. It's nothing to do with the job. Right. Um, the job is fantastic. The people there are awesome. Right. <laughs> I would totally recommend it. Anyone that has the opportunity to work there should, should do it. Uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, I don't really ever hear people who work, especially in those kind of roles. I've never heard anybody who left complain. It's always just like, it's amazing, right? People, it's what it is, you know, life happens. And so, you know, that's cool. But it just, it seems like every time I've ever met any of them, that's the, especially the people in those kind of creative type roles. Um, and I mean that for like the people who write the rules, the people who design the miniatures and the heavy metal team, they're all just like the nicest, most genuine, interested, artistic, friendly people. Like it just seems like the, that it seems like their recruitment is focused on getting people who are positive and who are going to be, you know, really like a, putting together a good team, which I think is super important as somebody who's done a lot of hiring in my life. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, you're dead right. I mean, that's definitely a large part of the recruitment process is not just, can you do this? You know, are you technically up to the level? It's definitely, are you going to fit into the team? You know, are you going to be uh, open to giving feedback and receiving feedback? You know, that's right. such a critical part of working in the studio. You're not, you're not just sitting there on your own, working on your own thing. Um, I mean, it's, it's a really tough job. It's hard work, you know, right. <laughs> and getting your head around some of the engineering stuff to do with plastic, uh, plastic injection molding is, is pretty tricky when you're coming into it because you're not just sculpting stuff all of a sudden. It's like, huh, I need to sculpt the miniature and think about how the miniature is going to split up and it's going to fit on the frame and I need right. to do the layout. So you're, you're trying to juggle like three separate things all at the same time and uh, it's a whole new level of complexity. But everyone's super helpful and they don't have, they're not, they're not expecting you to be like, you know, producing top notch stuff straight away. You get to work on some training projects to start with. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, it's awesome. Hard work, but really, really rewarding. That's awesome. I always think about like, um, that you're discussing like know it not only having to sculpt the thing but know how it's going to split onto the sprue i i remember there was a story that where that i heard about the giant kit and like the sort of and, and the clever design of i mean if you've put together a warhammer giant ever you know uh the leg is like this really unusual piece that's just like the back of the thigh and then the whole knee and then the back of the the um calf and then the front sort of sits over top of it and makes a whole leg in this really unexpected way right yeah. and it's just like it's this weird brilliant piece of of design that once it goes together you're like oh yeah of course but then you look at it on the sprue and you're like what is this which piece is this so it's just it's it's fascinating sometimes how that stuff gets split up i always think of that as like a super creative solution to that challenge of having what because they want because he wanted to have the exposed torn knee right where you actually had space inside and that yeah. accomplished it it was such a clever way to create negative space in the miniature yeah i mean there are some geniuses in the studio for doing that sort of stuff i mean i can remember I mean, steve party does some amazing splits on models you know and there's some people in there that really do clever <laughs> clever things like that yeah. yeah it's definitely a skill in, in, in itself i think some people out outside the company don't realize that it's, you know, it's actually the designers that, that do all that as well. You know, I think people, I think before I went there, I kind of had this vague idea that maybe there's a separate, you know, there's a separate team that like take these sculpts and work out how to, how to split them up and stuff, but it's actually, it's all down to the designers. So it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a challenging job. Sure. So, uh, now here we are, we're at the end of 2019 uh let's talk about your real quick here before we get into your stuff are you prepping up for may are you are you ready to go like are you are you well, you're, you're back in now you were you were relegated right. to the open category for right. a little while That's now it. you're back in well, i'll tell you what vince you see here's the here's the problem everyone thinks darren latham is a really nice guy <laughs> <laughs> when i left the studio he told me more than once that I would never win another golden demon. <laughs> so there's no point. There's no point in me entering. <laughs> oh, he's he's uh, he's hanging that over your head, huh? There you go. I feel it in writing, actually. But I'm never going to win another golden demon. He signed it, so you know. <laughs> there we go. Now, in all seriousness, I have not had a great deal of time for painting, and 
it's possible I'll enter something, but if, it, if I'm going to enter something, I haven't started painting it yet. And so it's going to be probably my usual single miniature Lord of the Rings or something. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> It's not, uh, it's not going to be a big year for me in terms of uh, Golden Demon entries. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. You know, you, you, <laughs> see, you get ease back into it. I understand it's been away for so long. Uh, after, you know, never mind the fact that I think you won in the open category both years. You were competing there when you could only do open. But, hey, that's fine. Uh, so, no, that'll be great. I, I hope to see you up there, man, if nothing else, because obviously yeah. I'm coming over again in May. and It's going to be a great time. Oh, I'm sure I'll go along if only to say hello to people, you know, but the, the chances are I'll enter something. I always do. Awesome. Well, let's look at some pieces. Speaking of entering things, <laughs> uh, hey, what this that's what this show is all about. Awesome segues. Uh, let's get into looking at some of your stuff. So we're going to cover up Gareth's face for a moment so we can all look at his stuff. There you go. We replaced Gareth with his work. So everybody on the screen now uh, okay. can see your Arwen, and that's where we're starting. So uh, take us through, I'm going to make her a little bigger here. Uh, take us through Arwen. Yeah, so I mean, I, I wanted to I wanted to include the Lord of the Rings piece just because, you know, I've always really enjoyed painting them. They don't they don't take me a huge amount of time. So one of the one of the challenges I always have with the way that I paint is because I tend to be very precise. It takes me an eternity to, to finish painting things. And that's why you never see me paint like a big monster or something like that, because I think to finish it, I'd either have to commit hundreds of hours or I'd have to kind of back off on the um, the perfectionism a little bit. Yeah, I and think I, the Lord Celestant on Dracoth is like the biggest thing I've ever seen you enter. Yeah, yeah, that's probably right. I, I think I'd, yeah, yeah, I'd agree. And I, I always find it a challenge because... Part of me would like to paint bigger stuff, but I know that as soon as I start getting a little bit more relaxed with blends and things, you know, making not not making everything as neat and precise as it can be, my my level of personal satisfaction goes right down. You know, right. when I finish piece, I'm kind of like, uh, I don't know, that could be better. This could be better. So. That's why I always end up painting single miniatures, really. I think because I it's a manageable project that I can I can push the perfectionism, but it's still you know I can finish it within a reasonable amount of time. And the Lord of the Rings miniatures kind of take that a step further because they're so tiny and right. they haven't they haven't got that many details on them. So it's usually a fairly simple like couple of layers of cloth or something. Do an awesome job on the face do a base and call it a day you know it doesn't take a huge amount of time so i've always really enjoyed painting them and i always i always try and make an effort because the sculpts from the lord of the rings range are i think are amazing when you look at them closely yep. the likeness to the actors from the films is incredible you know right but what what you find when you try and paint these faces is the slightest little bit of paint out of place will totally change the look of the face. And all of a sudden it doesn't look like the actor anymore. So it's always, I've always taken it as a personal challenge to try and retain that likeness that's in the sculpt and, and have, have the finished piece still look like, look like the actor. So I think Arwen was probably, I'd say the closest I've come to achieving that, you know, actually retaining the, the likeness of, uh, of Liv Tyler. Um, so I was, I was fairly pleased with that one. Yeah, this one's so good. I what there's there are things I want to make sure the audience keys in on that that are really amazing about this piece. And I, I agree with you. Like it, for those who haven't painted Lord of the Rings miniatures, they're in a true twenty eight scale, right? So as opposed to what we would think of as like the heroic, which ends up drifting more toward thirty two and even somewhat larger sometimes with your normal range of fantasy and forty k. But what I love here is the I love the softness of your skin tones and the subtle colors you've captured in here. But honestly, what blows me away about this piece is something you you incorporate into a lot of your work that I really love that you are an absolute master at. And that is the sort of micro texturing and the detail you've done here on the cloth in the way you've captured the reflections through through the application of texture. Uh, like you can really see it in the bottoms of the folds under her, 
yeah, I don't know what they are, her, her wristlets or whatever, you know, like the, the, yeah. these, these long hanging swoopy <laughs> wrist uh, things to her, to her, her, uh, her coat she's wearing. And then same with the reflection point where you've made it feel very silky, right? It just, it has this satin silky feel to it where I feel like if I touch the miniature, it would have that, that, that soft texture to it. I mean, obviously it isn't, it's plastic, but, uh, but that's how well, it comes across. That's what I'm against. <laughs> but yeah, it's absolutely great. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's the other thing with Lord of the Rings when you're painting it for competition, it's like, you've got a really simple miniature and you have to try and, and if you want it, if you want a place, you're going to have to try and differentiate it from the competition somehow. So it's always a challenge to try and get, you know, something in there that's going to, that's going to differentiate it. And obviously paint the face as well as you can. That's, that's really important. But yeah, if I can get a bit of texturing in on the cloth, if I can get a tiny little cheeky bit of freehand in, then I will do that. Um, I think, you know, that's just part of, that's just part of going to competition and bringing your A game, you know? Right. Right. No, she's, she's gorgeous. I love it. And yes, you're right. I'm sorry. Metal. Absolutely correct. Yes. I yeah. <laughs> Uh, the reason I say that is because when you're painting a metal miniature and you want to take it to that level, you really have to spend a lot of time prepping it before you paint it. You know, you're there with you're there with really fine grit sandpaper, um, smoothing that surface out. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. So, do you when when you're doing metal, do you what do you go up to with your sanding? Do you go all the way up to like a four hundred and eight hundred, a twelve hundred, something like that? Do you yeah. ever use um, uh, sure. um I know some people have talked about using the kitchen, like the, the scrubby thing you use in your kitchen, like that sort oh, really? of aluminum wire stuff or whatever. Okay. No, that never occurred to me. No, I, I do exactly as you say. I have some really fine grit sandpaper. I mean, I haven't painted a metal miniature for a very long time now, but I can remember, I mean, when I was getting into this Golden Beam stuff, it was, there was still a lot of metal miniatures around. Right. Um, and yeah, I was, I think I was going up to like 1200, 1500 grit, you know, really trying to get the, the surface smooth because it's so important if you're going to get a finish like that, you need the, the surface to be perfect. Yeah. Um, and of course with plastic, you don't have to worry about that. It already is perfect coming, coming out of the molds. <laughs> so that saves some time. <laughs> I did make a whole video called I hate metal models. And it was one of the <laughs> reasons why, it's because plastic has that natural smooth finish and metal. You've yeah. got to work forever to get there. Yep. Yep. It's just never going to be, it's just never going to be as, as smooth unless you just put in hours and hours of prep work. And I'm famously yeah. hate that sort of thing. So <laughs> there you go. All right, so you mentioned the Blood Angels diorama, and I'm gonna like I'm gonna skip direct to the whole diorama here. So we're starting on the picture that's the whole the whole shooting match, uh, and you won a sword for this one. This wasn't just a this wasn't just a demon winner. This was a sword winner, and this piece is just it's outrageous. We're gonna go to the detail shot in a minute, but I mean this thing to this day blows me away. This is the piece you were talking about, and it is this is a career you know, peace. I don't mean, I don't think you could never do anything better. I I'm sure and positive you could. I'm just saying like, this is something so masterfully well done and beautiful and, uh, and singular in its creation. So, so talk us through this thing. Cause it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. So obviously by the time I started this, I've been going to golden demons for a few years and I've been fairly successful. You know, I've been, I've won a few goals by this point and I was kind of thinking, what what do I need to do to win a sword? You know, because although you never say it deep down, you really want to win a sword. Everyone wants to win the sword. Of you course. You, you don't acknowledge it to anyone, but you, you want to. <laughs> right, right. And, and, and the feedback I'd always had from the judges was, you know, we really like your stuff. You need to paint something bigger. Because the stuff that was winning the swords was usually like a guy on a monster or it was a big diorama or something like that. I mean, I'm not saying the single miniatures were never winning, but that was the stuff that was generally winning the Slayer Sword. So, of course, me being me, I don't want to paint a big monster. I go, well, OK, maybe I'll just paint eight single miniatures and put them on one base. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Same, same thing. It's just going to take more time. But yeah, it's all just, <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's all just single guys. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I was, I was obviously, as I say, I mean, Blood Angels was always my thing. Um, and I was inspired by some of the amazing artwork that's knocking around. You know, there's, there's this there's this artwork from way back in second edition of all these red armored Blood Angels, you know, and they're, they're fighting kind of a last stand kind of pose, you know, and you've got this golden commander in the middle. Um, 
and that's that kind of thing has always stuck with me, and I kind of wanted to recreate it. So you'll you'll see on this on the diorama, there's only miniatures that were, you know, there's none of the newer stuff. Those miniatures that are in there are all stuff that was around in second edition. You know, you've got right. your Death Company, you've got your Tactical Marines, you've got a Terminator, and then you've got a guy that's, I mean, he's not Tycho, but he's kind of Tycho, you know. Right. So I had to have the, the Golden Commander in there. Yeah. So. This was my bid at winning Slayer Sword. You know, I knew that when I started it. I was like, I, I want to win the sword, and this is this is the piece I'm really going to have a real proper serious effort at, at winning the sword. Yeah, it was just an absolute grind. I think it took me eight months start to finish. That was the only thing I worked on in my free time, and um, you know, I was still, as I said, I started a full time job, but I was putting in, I was putting in a good number of hours every day because I would get up stupidly early like 5 a.m or something just to have a couple of hours of painting before i went to work um so i put in a lot of hours on that piece i, I don't know exactly how many i think that i think the painting time itself was something like it was more than 500 hours but then there was a lot more time in the planning and sure making sure that all the poses work with each other and there's some conversions in there's not a massive amount of conversions but the commander's got is, is, is a bit converted and the, the death company marines are, have got some conversions in them so yeah there was quite a lot of work before the painting even started but yeah i mean that piece nearly killed me it was, <laughs> it was so much effort to get it finished it's it's absolutely gorgeous and i want to flip over to this shot because you have this wonderful shot you included of like all of the detail and when I say you're a precise and really like clean painter at the detail, I think this shot just shows the, I, I'm going to be honest, insane skill that you have. Okay. Because I look at this stuff and like, I, I would really encourage the viewers to just don't just look at this, but see this. What I mean by that is, is, you know, don't just let your eyes kind of drift over it, but pick an individual detail and, and really zoom in. Like look at the, here's, here's just a small thing that caught my eye, but is so wonderful. This uh, blood angel gem that's on the top of the gold guy in the center's banner, like just the way you chose to catch the blood drop highlight with like the very slight white it, it, hitting the dot in the top center and then having a small dark spot on each side to separate it and make the white stand out more of the light reflection point at the top of the drop. And then the thin white line that fades into the yellow and cascades all the way around. And just like how smooth and precise that little thing is. And there's, there's, by the way, we could look around and see, you know, 20 other things in just this shot at the same level, but it's that kind of attention to detail that your, that your work always blows me away with. Right. Uh, it's, it's just absolutely fantastic, man. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was pleased with that. I, I kind of look back at it now and it's like, I can see things I, I think I'd do better now, but there's no way I'm going to try and do it again. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty great. And that's, Hey, you did it. There you go. So again, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we say we say I did it, but I've still got this nagging thing now because that 2015, as luck would have it, was the year where they, for whatever reason, they didn't have the big Golden Demon event, you know. So every year up until then, it was like you'd have the once a year, you'd go to Birmingham or late, later it was Coventry, and you'd have the big Golden Demon. But that year, they had a series of mini demons. At oh, Walmart. yeah, sure. So this ended up... I entered it in the Golden Demon Space Marines um, event at Warhammer World because there was no big Golden Demon that year. So in my head, I still haven't won a proper Slayer like Sword. <laughs> Golden Demon, of which course. is kind of annoying because I don't know whether I'm ever going to do a piece that, like that again. <laughs> sure, of course you would asterisk your own work. Well, I, I, if you want my vote, you're you're good. You're fine. This yeah. is fantastic. All right. And such wonderful use of the reds, too. Like, one of the things I love here is how rich your reds are. And that's all down to not only how you've highlighted so softly with, with when you go into the whites, but also just the softness of sort of the the darker color, the black, the black, purple, crimson, you know, the dark color that you've used there, I think yeah. really sets these guys off. Like, they're so well uh, separated. It's it's fantastic. Hey, thanks. All right. So next up, 
Well, again, we'll start at the at the whole shot. We've got uh, we've got our custodes leader. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm going to call him Trajan Valeris or something like that. That sounds like probably what his name yeah. is. I'm yeah. in the ballpark there. Yeah. So take us through this guy. Yeah. I mean, this one, I, just cause I think probably this was, yeah, this was entered into the last gone demon I could enter as a, a civilian, if you like. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of a more recent, a more recent piece. And I think it just, it's just a good example of pretty much all of the techniques that I'm kind of well known for on one miniature, you know. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it's my favorite piece, you know, as a finished piece, I don't I don't look at it and think, yeah, that's amazing. But um, I th- yeah, as I say, I think it's got, it's got all the techniques in there, you know, you've got the shiny armor, you've got some non-metallic metal, you've got the power weapon, you've got the lion with the fur texture on it, you've got the, the the cloth, you know, with the texture on that and a little bit of freehand. So I just think it's a, it's a good example um, of the sort of thing I do. But I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier, you know, it's it's a good example of me being technically proficient, but not really painting anything particularly exciting. You know, it's just take a take a stock figure, paint it in a slightly unusual colour scheme and then put it on a underwhelming base, which is always one of my hallmarks. <laughs> 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 Uh, you know, you say that, and I love that you say that. That's so funny to me because I look at this and all I see is the artistic choices that I think are so excellent and wonderful because you've got the big purple axe and you like, I'll, you, I've seen you do the lightning sort of weapon thing many times and you really are excellent at it. Like you're again, it really shows off your precise control because you're great at doing that. Like hyper hyper thin controlled line but then the way you balance the purple with the feathers and the gems that are kind of hidden all over him and pull that around and then sweep into the warmer red from an almost cold purple uh i think actually sets a nice warm cold contrast the and also just the white armor here man it's singularly incredible okay because it reads as as you know this bright color and yet you've so massively executed on like the 30 40 percent rule of adding depth and shadow to it like you have deep shadows hidden in that armor and yet it only serves to make the armor seem brighter like right no one would look at this and see anything other than the bright color uh you're so again i think this dude's you know fantastic for so many little things and and I, one of the things I want to point out on this, and we'll we'll look at the the close up shot here in a minute too, is you're really good with uh, capturing light and light reflections, and sort of you know having these secondary catches and stuff. One of the places that it, it's just I want to point the audience's attention to this little tiny light reflection right here on the bird. So what I'm pointing out is the bird that's on the back of his axe, right? Oh yeah, yeah, and you have this little tiny light reflection that just creates a secondary volume off of like the bird has a big chest and you have that lit and light lit like a globe. Right. But then he has this sweep into kind of a, I don't know, like the rest of his body, like before, before the wing. Right. And the, uh, that little tiny extra secondary reflection that's both on the top and then the purple tone of the reflected light from the ax and it just sets the two volumes so well. And it's something I always notice about your work, that you're really good at capturing light, not only in its primary reflection, but in the reflected light as well. And so I think- Yeah, that's- I think that's something I've continued to evolve at. You know, if I look at some of my earlier work, I kind of, the primary reflection was always there. I mean, the primary light source is always there because that's kind of the easy one. The way, the way I always approach these things is I'll take the miniature and I'll put it, actually just hold it under the lamp and I'll have an right. idea of where I want the light the light to be coming from. And I just observe on the miniature where the light is collecting, you know, and then I just literally put the paint there. You know, I take my first highlight shade and I just put it exactly where the light's hitting it. So that's easy. Um, and then and then you just sort of think about it a bit more. And the more you do it, the more you get a feel for where the light's going to reflect, you know, the secondary reflections you talk about, you know, it's it just it kind of, I think over time you just observe things in real life and you just start to 
think, oh yeah, maybe I could, you know, I could put a reflection in there, you know. And 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 some of the reflections you'll add will just be purely, you know, there's no science behind them. You just you paint something and you think, no, nah, looks a bit flat, you know. I'll put a, I'll just put a bit of a reflection on there um, from some, you know, uh, mystical object that's right, right. <laughs> outside, the, outside of the miniature, you know. Uh, just to make it look good so it's a combination of kind of thinking it through and you know taking some artistic license to try and make it just look good at the end of the day yep no it's great i switched over to the zoom in shot because one of the things you can't see from the front view is the big lion pauldron and yeah it's another great example of your your textures in play uh it looks like poor aslan down there but uh it's it's a great (laughs) capture of that miniature (laughs) It's just so much richness added to, again, what is ultimately a flat piece of plastic, right? And yet you've created like this wonderful texturing that just feels like, oh, yeah, that's that's a furry lion head, right? Like that's what that is. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is I've I've one of the most common things I see people do when they make glowing effects is they just kind of have a thing brightly glow. You know, like, it'll just be, like, the center is bright, and then just light extends out from there. Yeah. And I just want to point out real quick to everybody this, the little, I don't, I'm sure this thing has a name. The th- the, the the little tiny piece on power weapons that makes it a power weapon, you know, that little, <laughs> you know what I mean? The stick with yeah. the little ball on the end. Yeah, I worked you know, and I'm, I'm not sure I know what the real name for that is. I think I think I'd refer to it as a power node, but you know, I don't think that's an official term. <laughs> gotcha. Yes. Let's do that. Let's call it the node. So <laughs> that that node, it, you know, I just want to point out to everybody. I'll, I'll get my mouse out of the way here, but like, notice how he put the darkness around it. Like the thing itself is the brightest, and then around it, it gets softer. But there's that line of dark. And when we go back out to the big view, look at how much brighter it makes the node look because there's an area of dark around it. This is one thing I try to tell people all the time over and over again, that like that capturing that little contrast in that area is what will make it feel like it's actually glowing and quite bright, right? Like the light has to create a shadow, you know? Yeah, that's right. All right. So now let's uh, let's finish out here on something pretty exciting. And I'm going to let you talk through this one because we're actually not going to look at another painted miniature. Instead, we're going to look at something completely different. So take us through uh, through this lady here. Yeah, so I think you've got an exclusive here because I haven't even shared this on social media yet. Um, yeah, so that's why yeah. people come here for the exclusives. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why I watch Vince. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, since I've left GW, um, I obviously want to carry on sculpting. And this is just for fun, really. Um, I don't have a clear objective in my mind at the moment what, what I'm going to do, but I don't want to stop sculpting. I've really come to enjoy it and love it probably more than painting. Um, and I still love painting. Um, so, yeah, this is just an example of the sort of thing I'm doing now. I think one of the slight frustrations of working in the studio is there's this body of work that I've done, you know, for like a year and a half, and, I, and none, of it's, none of it's out there yet. Right, I to, right. <laughs> I have to wait until I can share it and show people what I've worked on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I love elves, and this is, uh, this is just a kind of dark elfy type type of lady. You know, it's just kind of fun to work on whatever I want to work on. That's... You know, if there is a good side about leaving the studio, it's that I can do what I want. <laughs> um, so I'm just indulging myself in sculpting what I want to. Um, I'm kind of in the process of figuring out how I'm going to, you know, how I'm going to get this uh, realised physically. I, I'm not super keen on going down the shapeways route, but 3D printers are a lot cheaper these days. So I'm looking into acquiring my own and uh, doing some experiments because I'm, I'm curious whether the quality that comes out of them is actually good enough like it'd be something i'll be happy painting you know out, yeah out of these budget printers you can buy today how good are they i'm, I'm not going to spend 100k on like an envision tech top of the line right. print um but yeah that's so it's um it's it's an interesting time for me yeah 
No, she's really cool. I, I dig her. And as uh, I, I agree with the miniatures paintbrush who commented, wow, where can I buy a copy? I agree. <laughs> put me put me second in line behind Rob there. Whenever you do bring it to market, if it does, uh, you've got you got two sales right here, my friend. So. <laughs> well, there we go then. You know, if I just if I just set the price high enough, then uh, <laughs> <laughs> $5,000 a piece. Boom, you're making your money back. You're good to go. <laughs> oh, no, she's really great. Uh, it's fantastic, man. I love that you're still keeping up with the sculpting. I can't wait to see, you know, the stuff that you do here. I think she's absolutely gorgeous. She's wonderful. And, uh, this is right in my aesthetic. Uh, I am a well-known fan of, uh, you know, like sexy elf murder chicks. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, this seems like you're right in line with where I, where my aesthetic is. So I dig it. Uh, no, it's great stuff, man. Okay. Yeah, I know I've still got a long way to go with the sculpting and I kind of like, one of the frustrations of leaving GW is I was on this trajectory where I could see I was getting better, you know, and just because of the feedback and being right. around awesome, awesome artists and, you know, learning so much. So I'm determined to keep improving, but I think it's going to be, unfortunately, a slower rate of progress when I've only really got myself to critique for my work. <laughs> Well, that's all right. I I have no doubt that uh, that you will you will still progress uh, just as quickly and make some awesome stuff. There's there's uh, I have no worries about that. If this is already what you're doing, I I can't wait to see. And uh, and once those things do release, we're back to back to you now on the screen. Once those things do release, by the way, you've got to pull a Tom Walton and and just you know share them out there and be like, hey, I made these things. Here you go. <laughs> like he's always, I love following him because it, it's he'll he'll always share when he when he puts out his sculpts, and I love a lot of his work. It's great stuff. So, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, I, I know some of my some of the stuff I've worked on is coming out in twenty twenty. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> All right, sir, are you ready for some lightning round questions? Yeah, bring it on. Okay, here we go. All right, so number one, uh, what do you what do you listen to or you know have on in the background? Do you have anything on in the background when you're painting? Do you use music? Do you use audiobooks? Anything like that? Or are you a silence? Yeah, it's, just, it's just solid Warhammer Week events. <laughs> You've made the right choice. <laughs> no, I mean honestly, it's it's a variety of things. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I um, yeah, I, I listen to stuff on YouTube. I mean, that's that's when I'm painting. I find it's interesting actually when I'm sculpting. I might as well not bother having podcasts or, or YouTube on anything that requires me to pay attention. I, right. I can't do it. I can I have music on while I'm sculpting, but. It, like if I'll, I'll play a podcast and I'll be sculpting for a few hours and I, the podcast finishes and I, I just think, well, I haven't actually listened to a word of that. Right. Um, so yeah, painting, I'll listen to all sorts of stuff, but sculpting just tends to be music. Nice. That's, that's really interesting, but like exact sounds exactly correct because of just the nature of how you're engaging your brain. It feels like that, that yeah, it's, it's exactly right. All right. Tough question. You've got to pick one. Okay, and that's why this is a tough question. You ready? Who is your current favorite miniature painter other than yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to say, yeah, and you're right. This is a tricky question. There's because a load of we could all sit here and do a list of 100 amazing artists. Right now. There's <laughs> no, that's not the challenge. It's who is personally your favorite if you had to pick one. Yeah, I'm going to have to say the legend that is Darren Maiden. And he is still he is still painting, so I can say that. There you go. Yeah, he's um, painting quite weekly now. He's got his own YouTube yeah. channel. He's blowing well, it up over there. I mean, it's amazing that he's doing that. I do not know where that man finds the time, I have to say, because I know what he puts into his day job. And to, to do that as well, I think is amazing. Um, so massive respect to him. But, you know, he's the reason that I... I've got into all this really because if we go back to 2010, if I hadn't have seen that Sanguinor, you know, I'm not sure I would have gone down the same route. So I think, you know, I still look at his work and I'm just amazed by it. I, and he, he's the guy I've always tried to emulate when it comes to painting. So sure. I, I you know, understand. I have to make up for the comment earlier about him not being a nice guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that just shows how that just shows the skill level, right? Because if if he if he made that and you're still picking him, there you go. It just shows it wins <laughs> out in the end. 
<laughs> and can I can I just I know you asked about painters, but I I yeah. like because this is sculpting is big. Yeah, for me as well. no, that's I. You know what? Absolutely, yes. Sculpting I have to mention well. my favorite sculptor because that is hands down, and I, he doesn't get enough recognition because he's such a quiet and nice guy. That is Seb Seb Purbe in in the GW studio. I mean, he's like. He's, uh, he's one of the content leads. Um, and basically anything that comes out for Age of Sigmar is pretty much down to Seb, you know. He, he's the guy that's coming up with all these awesome ideas. And I had the fortune to work with my desk very close to his for a long time. And it was amazing. It's so inspirational watching him work. I, words cannot express. So I have to mention Seb Purvey as favorite sculptor. Um, I mean, he used to paint a lot as well. Back in the day, he's got golden demons, I think, but um, yeah. I have to mention that guy. He's he's superb. That's awesome. Uh, I, I I have to add him to my Christmas card list. If he's the guy <laughs> who's who's doing all this great stuff for AOS that I've been loving, then yeah, oh. I, I need to make sure that I that I seek him out and shake his hand next time I'm over there and give him a personal thanks. I had no idea, and I'll I'll tell him that uh, that that you know it's it's. Uh, that that Gareth turned me on to the fact that you're the man who's responsible for so much happiness in my life. So you know that's, that's you're right. Like I, the sculptors, I I, I wish I, I follow all of them that I can on Twitter, both within like say GW and outside that. Right, like in the general world, because there's lots of people doing their own sculpting, as you said, freelancing these days. And I'm always so blown away by so much work that's going on. Like we live in a time. It's just an embarrassment of riches, right, for, for the sculpts that are out there and what's getting made. I cannot I, – I feel so lucky to be a miniature painter right now because I just – there is there is always ten times as many things that I want to paint as I would ever have the hours in the day to paint, right? Yeah. And that's that's an amazing position to be in. Okay. Yeah. Don't worry, I've seen I've seen the future, and that it's it's only going to get better, my friend. <laughs> oh, don't don't tempt me like that. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. All right, well that's good. Uh, okay, what is your uh, what is your again? You must pick one. What is your favorite color of paint? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know what? I'm going to have to say it's snake bite leather, and I'm talking about the paint, not the contrast paint, the outer production. Yes, yeah, so the original snake bite leather. Yeah, that was the secret for many years of my non-metallic metal. And although I've tried to replicate it by mixing other paints, I'm not sure I've ever quite got there. So uh, I'm going to have to go with that one. Gotcha. We need we need to get them to to just do a special run. It'd be like the Szechuan sauce at McDonald's, right, where they take back. <laughs> yeah just like the greatest hits and that would be that would be one of them like a special run of like the 90s hit paint kit where they could just it would be like snake bite and maybe like the original there's a couple other ones like maybe the original like moot green or something like that you know there'd be a couple from that time period there you go maybe <laughs> that purple ink that they yeah. had back in the day that was amazing yeah um leech purple that's another one they need to bring back because um go. the purple line is they're all quite cold purples and i feel like that one's got a lot more magenta in it that they should bring that back for sure there you go uh all right and this last question you can construe it in any way that you would like okay so you here's here's the question what are your favorite type of minis to paint and you can construe type however you like whatever that type means scale you know, elves, like whatever you like. What's your favorite type? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's 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 GW's Warhammer scale, and it's basically it's GW miniatures. You know, I've I've tried painting miniatures from other manufacturers, and whether it's nostalgia, I think that's about a big part of it. You know, GW is what I grew up with, and that's the style I like, and so I'm always going to come back to those miniatures. I paint other stuff. I painted some Infinity. They're awesome miniatures, you know. There's nothing wrong with them, but it's not. It's not what I'm excited about. So it's it's always going to be. I'm always going to come back to 40k and an Age of Sigmar. Well, I'm Warhammer Old World. I'm interested to see what comes of that. Yeah, I mean, for those of us who that was, and by the way, if, if folks in the chat have questions, you can feel free to drop them in now, and we'll we can always do a couple quick questions before the end. Uh, happy to do so. So if you've got a question, drop it in there. But no, I, I get that because it's, you're right. It is part of like some part of our brain is locked to that. My, my experience is being very close to your own, right? In that I started with Hero Quest. For me, it led to D&D, &D, but then right back to Warhammer Fantasy not long after that. And, you know, I, I still remember 
you know, I got like I inherited a a, a bunch of like Battle Masters figures I used for an Empire army for a while. But then I I was in a store maybe the first time I like actually went to a, a real proper game store after I started playing, and I walked in and I saw all the Skaven on the wall, and I was just like, oh my god, this is this is it. This is the greatest thing in the history of things ever, you know? And it just like, it, it indelibly imprinted itself, you know, on me. Right. And to this day, whenever I need to like clear my head, I just paint a Skaven mini, right. Just for myself. It's just, it becomes that palate cleanser. There's a, there's a comfort zone to it. Right. Uh, because it's been with you for so long. Yeah. So I, I get that a hundred percent. All right. Uh oh, Trevarian. Hey, what's up, Trevarian? Uh, he said, "Can you get snake bite through coat to arms? Because I know they still make some of the original colors. Is it still yeah, the same color? Maybe. maybe I should look into that. Yeah, I know they make some of the original ones. I don't know. I haven't. I've not tried. I have to admit. Well, there you go. All right. Well, I think. I think I can. I think I can get close to it with my with my secret mixes. So <laughs> Your your seven secret spices and and, <laughs> and recipes. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Rob from the Minister's Paintbrush says, uh, "Pro painter is a term that doesn't truly exist, but clearly you are in the upper level of painting royalty. Do you consider yourself a professional painter?" Um, no, I don't think so because I've tried. I did have brief experiments with trying to make money out of painting, which is. I would term if you're calling yourself a professional painter to me that says you're you're making your living from it in right. some way and i did i have toyed i've played with commission painting i've done a few commissions for people but it wasn't for me so i definitely wouldn't call myself a professional painter i've never painted for every metal i've you know i've done very few commissions it's it's always just been a hobby for me all right right on uh so this will be an interesting question to kind of turn because i honestly don't know how much you i, I think you use some so uh, the question from Minatrix was, uh, when do you decide to airbrush versus, you know, traditional brush? Like, how do you integrate that into your work? Yeah, I mean, growing up, obviously, it was always just using a brush and usually not a very good brush. Um, and I sort of became aware of airbrushing sometime in, you know, that 2010s decade. Um, and I could see the advantages because I kind of came to it fairly late it's never been a big part of my work um i do i do have an airbrush and why most miniatures i paint now i will put down a base coat with the airbrush right um if the miniatures in sub assemblies then I'll, I'll use that to my advantage and they'll be you know i'll use different colors on different <laughs> sub assemblies but it doesn't usually go much further than that um i have there are pieces i can think of like i did the um i've forgotten the name now it's the the uh in that triumvirate of India, the the lady with the cat, she's got a big flowing dress behind her. Oh yeah, sure. And I did a color fade on that, and I did use the airbrush for that, um, just to you know get that initial color fade down. But usually, no, very little airbrush work from me. It's something I'd like to do more of, really. But then it's just easy to pick up the brush and just get on with that, rather than mess around setting up my airbrush and. You know, because I don't, I've never used it that much, I'm not that proficient, so there's a good chance something will go wrong, and you know, it's just easy to stick to what I know I'm doing. Sure. I'm doing. sure, absolutely. All right, well, sir, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for coming on, man. It's great to talk to you. Uh, it's been my pleasure, Vince. Is uh, like I said at the start, it's uh, it was a real honor to be asked to come on here, <laughs> and I kind of thought, wow, he's scraping the bottom of the barrel if he's asking me. <laughs> interview with artists i'm not sure i'm an artist <laughs> you you made that you, you mentioned that originally i think that's crazy crazy you are my friend no i am so uh thrilled you came on it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you sir and uh hey i'll see you in uh maybe like six months ish right so yeah, no, it's fantastic that you come over you know that you make the effort to come over for a uk golden demon i know you've got your us golden demon now so uh oh i'm so still coming over to the uk no yeah. I see, yeah you believe you me i don't plan on not showing up it just <laughs> means that i've got to do more work in advance right but <laughs> but it'll also give me a chance to hopefully get feedback on something before i then bring it over there you know so it's a, oh, it's a yeah. win win yeah yeah if, uh, if I fail once and can get good feedback, then I can go back and do all the extra work and then come in <laughs> ready to go. See, it's, you got to look at it that way. Yeah, I like, I like the way you're thinking, Vince. <laughs> all right. Well, Garrett, thank you very much, sir. To all of you who are watching, thank you very much for watching. Really appreciate it. As always, we'll see you next time.